Welcome to the 12th episode of Legal Affairs. I am Lawrence Ma. Today we will explore a list of topics that we think the new John Lee government should consider passing laws on. Now these topics include fake news, abuse of police officers on duty, intimidation of judges and child abuse. In the studio today we have Mr. Granville Cross SC. Mr. Cross is a senior barrister who was appointed Director of Public Prosecution of Hong Kong in 1997 and held this post for over 12 years until 2009. He was the first DPP to be appointed after the transfer of sovereignty of Hong Kong and he is also an honorary professor of law at the Hong Kong University. Now, he will give us more insights on these topics. Now, Mr. Cross, Singapore has fake news law and should Hong Kong have it and will that affect our uh, freedom of expression? Well, as you, as you well know, uh, Lawrence, during the insurrection of 2019-2020, uh, numerous weapons were used uh, against the authorities here in Hong Kong. I suppose the weapon of choice was probably the petrol bomb, which was deployed on the streets, uh, but also very popular was fake news. Mm. Uh, and fake news was uh, used uh, in order to, in, with uh, very considerable effect uh, to cause maximum problems uh, for society. Uh, you remember, for example, that uh, uh, stories were put around that the police had killed protesters at Prince Edward Station, that the police had blinded a woman, that they drowned a student, that they were raping protesters who'd been arrested in the police stations. All these type of fake news were being disseminated. And why was this so? I mean, we have to ask ourselves that. Uh, and the reasons really are quite clear. First of all, they wanted to, uh, to demonize the police force and put them in the worst possible light. Uh, secondly, they wanted to uh, cause public alarm and public uh, concern. Thirdly, they hoped to uh, recruit uh, other gullible people who might be taken in uh, by these uh, stories and persuade them that they should be taking to the streets and indulging in violence against the police. Uh, and fourthly, they wanted to provide material uh, to foreign news agencies, which could then be uh, deployed around the world, shown to in other countries, uh, in order to put the Hong Kong police force in the worst possible light, uh, and by doing that, to drum up opposition to the Hong Kong government and indeed to, to China more generally. So this was a highly sinister instrument in the hands of the, the protest movement. Uh, and as I say, it, it did a lot of damage, but it illustrated more than anything else. Right. Something had to be done to, to control this type of activity. Uh, obviously, there had been fake news in the past, but nothing on this type, this type of scale. Uh, and so something had to be done. Uh, and in my view, what we now need uh, is, a, is a fake news law, mm. such as the, the one they have uh, in, in Singapore, which has uh, been very effective. It, it came in about three years ago. Uh, it's uh, known as the uh, Prevention of Falsehoods and uh, Manipulation Act. Uh, and it can be used uh, in circumstances where someone uh, knowingly or, or with, with uh, or reason to believe puts out a statement which is false, uh, which is likely to cause public alarm or likely to uh, have an effect on, on public order, uh, or which is likely to uh, have health implications, for example. Uh, and this type of conduct obviously has to be prescribed. Now, clearly, it does involve some curtailment uh, of uh, the right to, to say whatever you want and publish whatever you want. But the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights recognises that legitimate restraints are, are per perfectly permissible. They can, for example, be, be, be uh, introduced where uh, it's necessary for public order or, yes. or, for, uh, or for national security exactly. or indeed to protect the, the rights of uh, particular individuals. So uh, there is no absolute right to publish whatever you exactly, want. Yeah. There have to be reasonable restrictions yes. uh, and uh, this is recognised internationally. So this is the type of law that, in my view, we need uh, and, uh, and it is legitimate. So after we enact that law, because when drafting the law, we will comply with the ICCPR and the basic law of freedom of protection of uh, information, so to make the law constitutional. Now let's come, let's come to the second question. We can see vast examples of insults and abuse of public officers uh, in recent years, including the police, um, particularly during the 2019 riot. Now is that the reason that we want laws on this? Well, it certainly brought it all to a head. I mean, the, the, the protest movement indulged in vile abuse of police officers. These were decent uh, police officers who were going about their regular duties, trying to control crowds, trying to prevent violence breaking out. Uh, and they were subjected to endless invective uh, and, uh, and insults. Uh, and so the question really is, 
whether when a police officer dons his uniform and goes out to perform his duties, uh, he has to accept this type of uh, abuse. Uh, in my view, he doesn't. Uh, the ICCPR actually recognises that, uh, as we've just said, that restrictions on the, on the right of expression uh, are justifiable uh, as where uh, they're necessary to protect the rights or the reputations uh, of, of others or to protect public order. Uh, and uh, the reason that there was so much abuse uh, was in order to try to provoke police officers uh, into overreacting. Yeah. And of course, if they overreacted, yeah. then the foreign media was on hand with their cameras ready to, to film the whole thing yeah. uh, and then uh, broadcast it globally and say, uh, this shows what a terrible police force Hong Kong has. So this was part of a, a strategy, make no mistake. Mm. This was a deliberate tactic to try and provoke the police force. Uh, and so the question that really arises is whether this is uh, something that uh, should be uh, tolerated by, by the police force. Uh, and uh, police forces elsewhere, governments elsewhere, have taken the view that uh, this, is, this crosses the red line mm. and that police officers should not have to face this type of uh, vile abuse. Yes. No other citizen would have to face this type of abuse when they're doing their ordinary, going about their ordinary duties. So, so why should police officers? This has been recognised in Singapore, where this type of abuse is now prescribed. And it's even, um, uh, it's even recognised in places like France. They also have a law that uh, prescribes the uh, in insulting of, of police officers. So I think we have to learn from recent experiences and to provide our police officers, uh, well, it wouldn't just be police officers, it would be all law enforcement officers, customs officers, immigration officers and so on, uh, who all require to be properly defended uh, from vile abuse. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned the, uh, the right of free expression. Don't forget this, Lawrence, that we already have restrictions uh, on, the, on, on what uh, people can say uh, in relation to some law enforcement officers uh, under the, uh, under the, the uh, uh, for example, the birth and registries uh, ordinance and the, the, the public health ordinance. Uh, there are restrictions on what people can say uh, in relation to insulting uh, particular officers of those departments. Those, those have been in place for many years uh, and they haven't proved problematic. Uh, there's been no challenge to, to those particular provisions uh, uh, under the ICCPR or, or anything else. So there is a precedent already there in place. So I would regard this as an extension uh, of that to, to the police officers who are doing frontline duties. Right. Now let's move on to question three that we have um, about... Um, we also see intimidation of judges and prosecutors in public forums. Um, I understand that we can charge the culprit for contempt of court um, but it seems, is that enough? I mean, well, of course, we've, we've seen uh, very serious intimidation of particularly judges in recent times when they've gone about their, their duties. Uh, some of them have been sent uh, messages threatening them and their families. Some have been sent uh, foul materials through the, through the press, told that they, they and their families are going to be bombed, all these type of things, in, in order to try and uh, intimidate them in not, into not doing their, their jobs properly. The, the penalties for criminal debt, criminal intimidation, uh, criminal intimidation are actually very low. Uh, two years for, uh, in, in, on summary convictions, the maximum, uh, and on indictment, uh, it, it's five years. And as you remember, Lawrence, some years ago, the, uh, the maximum penalty for uh, attempting to pervert the course of public justice was raised from seven years uh, to, to an indefinite term. Uh, that, that was done in order to provide the, the law with, with proper teeth. Uh, and of course, criminal intimidation is a type of attempting to pervert the course of public justice because uh, you try to intimidate judges or prosecutors uh, to, to do particular things or not to do particular things. So we have to have realistic penalties in place uh, and I would have thought that uh, there would be a very strong case uh, for increasing the, uh, the penalties for criminal intimidation uh, and I, I don't see how anyone could seriously say that was uh, objectionable. Uh, so I'm very much in favour of that. So. Uh, Obviously our judges need to be protected and it's incumbent on the legislature to make sure that they are properly protected. Uh, and as I say, I can't see any serious objection uh, to, to uh, considerably increasing the maximum penalties. Right. Now let's mo move on to our last uh, discussion. I know that you are also the patron of an NGO which is called a, a Against Child Abuse, right? Um, can you tell us why we need more laws or better laws on Against Child Abuse? Well, child abuse, Lawrence, is a very big problem in Hong Kong. Uh, and it has been for many years. Uh, the government has recognised this and that was one of the reasons they established the Commission on Children, which is chaired by the Chief Secretary uh, in 2018. Many people hoped that commission was going to be an engine for change, but actually very little has happened. Uh, and many of the reforms that were required uh, simply haven't come to pass. Uh, so let me tell you the problem that we're confronting. Uh, in May of this year, 
the Social Welfare Department revealed that there'd been a 45% increase uh, of cases of child abuse uh, in 2021. Uh, there'd been 1,367 from memory cases reported. Uh, and this was just the tip of the iceberg because those are the only the cases that have been reported. The vast majority aren't, never come to light. Right. You see, they never come to light. Often they're committed in homes and so on, uh, and no one knows about them. The child suffers in silence uh, and uh, doesn't know who to turn to for help. Uh, and uh, so nothing is ever done about it. So the suffering of children is compressed and they just have to try and deal with it as best they can. But th that's uh, only, only, only one statistic. The, the police uh, reported uh, earlier this year that uh, sexual abuse cases of children went up by 60% last year. The, my, own, uh, my own NGO uh, against child abuse recently did a, a survey of 700 children uh, and this, these are children aged 6 up to 17 uh, and 49% uh, of those children reveal that they had been physically abused uh, in a domestic uh, situation. So this type of abuse is going on all the time, it is a major problem and very little is actually being done about it. Uh, war, uh, uh, alarm bells have been ringing for some time, for example the uh, the Law Reform Commission recommended in 2021 that an offence of sexual grooming should be introduced as soon as possible uh, and allied to an offence of uh, sending uh, sexual messages to children. That still hasn't happened, that has to be prioritised. Uh, uh, about a year ago the, the Law Reform Commission recommended that a new offence should be created of failing to protect a child uh, in, uh, in circumstances where the death or the serious harm to the child results from uh, uh, an unlawful act or, or from neglect. Uh, th when this was proposed in England, it was rushed straight through the Parliament. Here it's been talked about for many, many years. It was first talked about when it was referred to the Law Reform Commission in 2006. Nothing's happened after all those years. So this law is urgently required, but hopefully the new government will take this on board. But uh, one of the most important ones that's required, the most important uh, child protection laws, is the one that the uh, outgoing Chief Executive, Carrie Lamb, actually mentioned in her last policy address. Right. She said during the course of the next legislative session, uh, she planned to bring forward a law for the mandatory reporting of child abuse. Uh, because uh, that is an area that obviously needs urgently addressing. Mm. Uh, many countries have now introduced laws prescribing uh, mandatory uh, reporting of child abuse, such as Australia, such as Canada, such as the United States, such as Japan and so on. Uh, and so that's what we need here. So that if people do become aware that a child is being abused, whether they're, whether they're neighbours, whether they're medical professionals, whether they're teachers, whether they're doctors, whoever they may be, they would be under a duty to report it if they reasonably suspected that a child was being abused. So these are some of the main areas, uh, Lawrence, where, where uh, action is required. Uh, we also need, for example, a, a, a law in relation to internet pornography. Mm -hmm. uh, it's far too easy for children to get access to internet pornography and as you appreciate, this can have a very damaging effect uh, on, on, on their mental growth. Obviously, children can't buy pornographic magazines uh, uh, because they, you have to be 18 and they're, they're all wrapped up and so on. But uh, those sort of restrictions don't apply if it's on the internet. Exactly. And uh, so there has to be an obligation put on internet service providers for age verification to make sure that uh, only adults can access that type of material. So these are the sort of areas that, uh, that very urgently need to be looked at, in my view. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cross, a very informative session. Um, this is the program for today, but Mr. Cross will also be available in our next episode with Mr. Stephen Yap. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>